Hi brothers and sisters, we're back for uh, probably our last video, if not it's one of two last videos um, to take a quick look, or maybe not so quick, look at the House Enforced of Lebanon, which we've looked at over uh, a series of videos. Anybody who's been watching my videos, you already understand what the House Enforced of Lebanon was, is, and why it is so important. And, um, but we're, we're gonna start, um, with this passage, and then we're just gonna carry through and see where it takes us, okay? So Matthew 16, 9 says this. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. But whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, what we come to understand is that the key of David is in total opposition to the key of Solomon. And so it, here it's talking about the keys of the kingdom. And what we discovered was that the key of David was in actual fact the daughter of Zion herself. And the key of Solomon is the harlot spirit, Babylon, exalted in man's heart. Now, we understood that. Now, this is what I've recently been led to understand. All right, and we're going to share it here tonight. So the key of David actually possesses, once we get looking at this, and I think I'm going to say it right, um, the keys of hell and of death, and is in actuality the keys of kingdom, the keys of the kingdom. Once we get examining deeply what in actual fact Solomon was attempting to do, it is that he was trying to overthrow God off of the throne. That's what he was up to. And it meant he had to dig into a place to marshal an army that had never been used before. And what I mean by that, we're going to take a look at it right now. So we're going to go to, okay, and I got the wrong bunch of passages pulled up here. We will look at them in a minute. To Psalm 7. And this is what it says in Psalm 7, 15. And this is what the key of David has led us to understand. All right, this is what it's going to take us to. Verse 15, he made a pit and digged it. And is fallen into the ditch which he made. So, what ditch? What ditch did he dig? Alright, so we'll keep reading here just to finish this passage. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own. It says, uh, how do you say that? Pate? Um, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Okay, so it's going to come back on us, on himself, is what it's going to do. And so we're going to look at that as we go. But this actually takes us to this passage here. He dug a ditch, right? He made a pit. What's the pit? All right, okay, I'm looking for just a second here. Okay, these are small. Okay, so we're looking at. Isaiah 22 is where we found one of the key passages to understanding um, who actually dug the pit. It was one of five in identifying the key of David. So we're going to take a look at verse 11. It says, Isaiah 22 verse 11, He made also a ditch between the two walls for the water. Alright, we have water here. Of the old pool, but ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto, not him, her, her, that fashioned it long ago. So here we have another ditch. He made also a ditch. Now, we understood who this was by understanding the key of David. We understood it was King Solomon. That's what we understood. Now, we're going to keep going. And we're going to figure out 
just what that pit is with water in it that he was digging. So first we're going to read these passages. Proverbs 5. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. Verse 15. Proverbs 5. And running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind. Actually, it's a she-goat. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. But he wasn't. No, he wasn't. He actually tears down her well is what he does. Yeah. And we're going to go to... Uh, let's see if we can find it here. Jeremiah 8 is one of the passages we're going to find where they actually tore down the well. So this is what it says in Jeremiah 8.22. It says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the help of the daughter of my people recovered? That's what it says. So, what's the bomb in Gilead? Okay, so if we backtrack, actually, if we go to Song of Solomon 4, 12, we've done there, and it's actually Song of Songs, it's not the Songs of Solomon. <laughs> no, that's the lie that got told and spun out into the world. Um, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. All right. So, is there no bomb in Gilead? Well, let's look up a spring. It means a heap, a wave, a billow. Oh, look, a rock garden, a rock pile, ruins, stone heaps. Why is that important to note? A pile of stones. Why is that important to note? Well, let's go back <clears throat> to Jeremiah 8.22. And let's just look up the meaning of Gilead. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Okay. So that's 1568 is your Hebrew word. It says it's a region in Palestine. It's also the name of several Israelites. And... It says this, once we get there, probably from Gal-Ad, or Gilad. So let's look that up and see what that means. Oh, look, a witness pile. That's what it says, a witness pile. So do you suppose, by putting these passages together, that the ditch that Solomon dug was to actually drain the well of water? that he was to receive from the wife of his covenant. How do we know that? Because of Malachi 2. Right? I'm not doing a very good job. Sorry about that. So, um, Malachi 2, what does it say? It says, Judah had dealt treacherously, an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which she loved and has married the daughter of a strange God. Getting a little bit closer there, ain't we now? And now we're going to verse 14, Malachi 2. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom you have dealt unfaithfully with. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of this covenant. But you tore her well of water down, where in Proverbs 5, it's told you you are to receive your water from your own well, from your own cistern. And then if you go to 
Psalms, not Psalms, Song of Song, 412, what does it say? You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Look at that. Look at that. So where was the first Adam to receive his water from? His wife. His own well. But what did he do? Well, if we look at what Solomon did, he took to him 700 wives in covenant, is actually what he was doing. He was actually making covenants with the nations that surrounded him and with the king's daughters of those nations, all right? And he brought them in to the land of Israel, or Judah in this case, to which then we see him daubing up the breaches in David, David's wall, his father. And what that meant was that he was actually preventing the rightful daughters of Zion their birthright to flow into Judah with their water, with their word. And he was receiving it at the mouth of another. Actually, he wanted to be in covenant with these harlot daughters that would build him up. So he actually changes the foundation is what he does. And so we see this ditch that mankind has fallen into because what the harlot spirit does, what we've learned the harlot spirit does, is that the harlot spirit will preach man as God. And that's what King Solomon wanted. That's what he was doing. So, now, how did I go about doing this? So, okay, i got to find the right passages here. Okay. So the witness pile we found. Okay. So where we want it to go is, let me see here. What Solomon was doing was he was actually going after the house and the force of Lebanon, is what we discovered, by understanding and connecting a series of passages that indicates that it was indeed King Solomon that was actually um, changing uh the flock in the midst, which was known as the flock of Basra. Now, we've done this. So, I'll pin the Key of David study where we put together these passages to understand it all. Because if I keep going over it, the video would just be so long and will not hit it. But one of the key passages that we understood what was going on was Isaiah 22. All right. And it says this... Um, so it says, ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, and ye gather together the waters of the lower pool. So we understand from the allegory of Galatians 4 that there was two women allegorical to two covenants. God says, you divided my pleasant land, which is akin to the daughters of Zion, and you divided my waters um, so that you could eventually add mixture that's your idea of the admixture of doctrine sitting on Proverbs 9's table, wisdom. Proverbs 9, verse 1, wisdom has been forced to mingle her wine, she says. So this becomes an admixture. But eventually, Zion becomes a dry desert land. All right? And if you link the word Zion and look her words up, it means a dry desert land. Because what was going on here was Solomon was drying her waters up. But we get this understanding also. Now if I can find it here. We'll read this one first too right here. Right quick. So Luke 6, 39. What does it say? Jesus also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the pit? So if Solomon dug the ditch and fell into it, when did we ever crawl out of it? 
because the idea of the harlot spirit that he exalted in his heart when he took these 700 wives that would build him up as king was to build man up as God on the earth. That's your idea, and it's also your false foundation that gets laid. So when it says the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, it is talking about the righteous spirit and the wife of the original covenant that he gnashed at to remove the spirit of her covenant out of the land. That's what we're talking at, talking about. Now, I wish I'd have done it this morning because I had it so much better. Now, when we look these words up in Psalm 7, verse 15, this is what we get. Okay? So he made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. All right? Now we just link that to Isaiah 22, 11. He made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pools. Now we understood, like I said, who did that. That was King Solomon. And his purpose was to go after the house in the forest of Lebanon. And he discovered, because he was so wise, he actually discovered the covering of Judah. He discovered what was protecting them. He actually discovered this. And we speculated that it was Gehazi, who was a turncoat. And he was. He wanted money. And when we look at um, when, uh, what was it, Nahum come to be cured of um, leprosy, um, he wanted to give um, Elisha gifts of clothing and of money. And Elisha refused. He said, no, 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 we don't operate that way. Uh, we speak for the Lord. And so we don't take, you know, you are sick. And we're not going to make money off of your sickness, is what um, Elisha said at that point. But after Nahum, Nahum leaves, not Nahum, oh, what was his name? Now I can't remember. And uh, anyway, Gehazi follows him out and says, you know what, we decided we do want uh, the, the raiment that you've promised and, and the money because we've had some more men come in and we need to, to clothe them. And so he receives all these gifts that are gave to him. So it shows you that he wanted money. He was after money. He was after goods and riches. And as a servant of the Lord, he should not have been after these things. And as a result of that, that greed brought on for him um, leprosy. He ends up with leprosy. Gehazi did. But Gehazi name means, the, means valley of vision. And Isaiah 22 is called the burden of the valley of vision. That's why we link Gehazi here. And I believe he was the turncoat that was in the camp of Elisha, because he was like his understudy, Gehazi would have been. And when Gehazi begins to be very frightened, because there's an attacking army coming in, the, um, Elisha says, Oh Lord, open his eyes and show, showing the great multitude that, that is with us is so much greater than the host that's with the enemy. And at that time, Gehazi begins to understand what the covering of Judah is. And he hands that covering off to Solomon, though there is some idea that Solomon already knew it. He just wanted it verified because of what we read in Ezekiel 28, all right, and how wise that king was. Now, once we realize who is in view here, is in fact King Solomon doing this? in Isaiah 22, and I'll post the study underneath of how we linked the key of David and understood what was going on and that it was all about King Solomon, all right, changing the portion in the midst. His name also links to the number 666. He brought that physical statue, image of a statue, King, man, God, as your Lord and ruler, down to an actual... Um, Worship of man as God on earth is what he did. And we did that in a video, right? Because it says here in um, 
What's the passage? It is. Okay, well, we'll read Revelation 13, 18. Um, it says, The present article argues that 666 in Revelation 13, 18 is best related to the notice of Solomon receiving 666 talents of gold. That's in 1 Kings 10.14 or 2 Chronicles 9.13. It says, which is in turn an important notice of this king's wayward and unjust practices, his inordinate wealth, exploitation of his own people, and eschewing of God's law. And he did. We've proved that it was him that did this that built himself up as a great king. 1 Kings 10.14 The weight of the gold that Solomon receives was 666 talents. Now that's the number of the man in Revelation 13.18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, the beast system that he built up. And who's writing it? The harlot is writing it because he builds a harlot up in his, in his um, heart. And the harlot's purpose is to be the foundation that will exalt a man as God, which is what Solomon was after. So let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. Well, the number of the man takes us back to that golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar built up. He was building Babylon's belief system up that man was God. And Solomon was taking these women in covenant and was building himself up, basically a very powerful army. That's what he was doing. And so... Eventually, you see him coming against the house in the forest of Lebanon. Now, if we go to Song of Songs, and my thoughts are all over the place, but we're going to keep looking at this. We go to Song of Songs here. We're told that the living waters that will save you flows from Lebanon and from your wife. They're going to wash the blood off of you. The blood makes you guilty. That's the blood covenant. This is the covenant that will cleanse you. And it's akin to the laws of wisdom. Mother from above that gives life to you. Who they cast off and did not want in covenant. Solomon took harlots that would build him up and his laws up. Right? That's your false foundation. Alright? So, verse 15. A fountain of garden, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Where was Lebanon? It was in the North Kingdom. So we have Judah and we have Israel. We have the two tribes, three, some says, of Judah. And then we have the ten northern tribes of Israel, which also goes by the name of Ephraim. So here we see him. He discovered the covering of Judah. And he did look in that day, to the armor of the house of the force, that's a house in the force of Lebanon, he discovered the covering of Judah, what protected them, what gave them eternal life. And it was these women, who was known as the government of God, who met in the house of the north congregation, known as the house in the force of Lebanon, where they would take the word of God and flow like a living water as the key of David through the breaches, the gateways of David that he had daubed up. Alright? That's what we see. So, <coughs> what was he actually doing in Psalm 715? Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. Now, we're going to backtrack just a minute here. Because... It says in Jeremiah, is there no balm in Gilead? Now, I had said that was akin to the water in the well, which would have healed the daughters. I'm a little bit off. What it looks like is the well developed a crack, is what it looked like. And the balm, the resin that could have healed those fractures that was happening in the well of water, that would have allowed it to be retained and to heal back, it says, is there no 
healing in Gilead? Is there no balm in Gilead? Where is the resin from these trees that would heal that well and allow it to be continue to be filled with the water of Mother God's word from above, wisdom's word from above? So that's why it says, is there no healing in Gilead? And that's why it lends you to the pile, the witness pile of rocks. When they were rejecting the covenant with these righteous daughters of Zion that held Mother God's law in their mouth, um, they were willing to die for it, and they did. They were burned to ashes, is the idea. And the idea is that the daughter of Zion herself was a lamb, which is virgin-like, that's your word there, slain before the foundation of the world. Before it. Which is akin to them murdering the spirit of this covenant in the marriage chamber that we read in one of our videos. That was found in 2 Ezra chapter 10. Now, that's what they did. So the false foundation got established. That's what we were looking at. Now, when we look at this ditch that got dug by King Solomon is what it looks like. These are the words we're actually looking into. And it's interesting because it tells us where he was digging. So pit. The pit here is a pit, a cistern, a well. So he dug it out. He drains it. All right. He dis uh, members the, the pile of rocks that are used to build this well up, which is akin to the daughters. That's right. And then what does he do? If we keep going and looking at these words. He dug it out <clears throat> to dig, to search. What was he searching for? What was he searching for? Do we have any idea what he was searching for? I think I do. To delve, to explore, to dig, to carefully search out or look carefully about before it says going to rest. To dig, to paw. There we got paw, like a fox, don't we? A, a fox likes to dig is what we're told. And that word fox is very important because the beloved, actually it says they, they're speaking to her. I believe it's mother and son is speaking to the daughter of Zion saying, catch for us the foxes that would spoil the vineyard that's in bloom. That's right. So here we have paw. They're pawing. He's pawing. He's digging at something. He's looking for something. What's he looking for? What's he looking for? Okay. He's fallen into it. This pit that he's dug out, he's fallen into it, it says. Okay. Into the ditch. What's the ditch? It says a pit. Let's keep going. A dungeon. Destruction. Uh, to undergo decay. What else does it say? It's a pit for catching a lioness in, perhaps. Yeah. Let's see. Corruption. It's a pit of corruption. Destruction. Ditch. <gasps> Grave. A sepulcher. A pit. A trap. Destruction. What's that? Sheol. What was he looking for in Sheol? What was he looking for? What does she have to say in Revelation? We're going to go to Revelation. What does it say? This is what it says. I am he, no, she, 
the rejected spirit, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive. So this is the spirit reborn, Ariel, out of the dust of the earth that you see in Isaiah 29, verse 4. And God is hearing a familiar spirit as of one who is speaking the spirit of her covenant once again. This takes you to Deuteronomy 32, when she says in verse 18, You forgot the rock that birthed you and writhed in pain to bring you forth. You forgot all about me. And she says, Now I raise my hand to heaven, that's a symbol of an oath, and I swear by myself that I live forever. You can't take me out. I'm the Holy One, I'm the Eternal One, and I am cut from my mother Israel, who is from above. That's right. So she says, not he says. They want to make everything a man. This is not a man. I guarantee you this is not a man. This is a woman. I am she that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Guess what keys he was after? King Solomon was digging for? And have the keys of hell and of death. That's what he was digging for hell and death. And you know what he did? He fell into the pit. That's what he did. He drained her well. He dug a ditch. He dismembered them. That's right. Caused them to be considered a witness pile. They were witnessing to the truth in their death. And he dismantled them. That's the word I'm looking for. And he dismantled the well of water. That's right. And he dried Zion's waters up. She became a dry desert land where she actually ends up being cast out to bear the sins double Israel upon her head for what had went on in Israel. That's right. Which Solomon is seen being a part of all of it. So he tears the house in the forest of Lebanon then Actually, he, begin, he takes control of it. Now, this is where, if I can get this going straight, we'll go to Isaiah. Uh, not that Isaiah. Okay, so, let me see here. So we're going to Isaiah. Where is that here? Okay. Isaiah 14. We're going to read it. That's what we're going to do. Um, uh, maybe not all of it. Okay, we'll start maybe in verse 3 of Isaiah 14. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou hast been made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. In essence, it was King Solomon that established the harlot system wherein you see that harlot in Revelations upon it, right? Because what you're, you're looking at is he exalts a harlot in his heart so he can play God. That's what it is. That's the beast system that he built. 666, the number of the man that built that system, is King Solomon. And I was going somewhere with that thought and forget it that fast. Okay, so we'll hit it at some point. Um, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, say, How has the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the ruler. That's the harlot spirit broken. That's what that is. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked. Okay. Um, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nation in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. So, he's angry. Now, the Shulamite says this. I'll find it. And Song of Songs 1, 6. 
right? This is what she says. She says, I'll get there. <laughs> Sorry. My thoughts, I'm tired lately. I, I'll tell you the truth. I'm just tired. Um, she says, what? No, not six. I said one. It's being difficult. Okay. What does the Shulamite say? This becomes very important to the number 666. All right. So my thoughts are all over the board tonight. We're just going to roll with it. She says in verse 6, Look not upon me because I am black. Because the son has looked upon me. My mother's, it says sons in the other translation, were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard. But my own vineyard have I not kept. Now I'm going to briefly insert here. The reason why they appear to be angry with her. Okay? And this is a lesson that you have to learn when you are a Lord and you have great responsibility. You cannot be domineering. And there is some semblance to this idea that she may well have been built up on her own power. Yep. So she, the men got angry. So Because there is this Lord Mara in Daniel. And the word is Mara for Lord there. Who is a revealer of secrets. She is the one that was revealing the secrets to Daniel. In the book of Daniel. In one of the passages there. And the word there for Lord. Has the idea of being a domineering master. So she may have come to an, an area of her life. Where she was very much domineering. Now. That's just speculation. Because it also tends to lead you. To the one that caused the rider to fall back. So what are we actually looking at in the context? I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to continue to look at it. Because it's a bit of a mystery. But it may be linked to why the sons were angry with her. Alright. And yet she says my own children I must restore. Uh, I must restore back that which I took not away. So she didn't actually take the children away. Um, but she may have been a domineering master. Um, is the idea with that number Lord. With Daniel as a revealer of secrets. So I'm still looking at it in the way that the word links to Mara is interesting. But the Shulamite then says, look not upon me because I am black. Because the son hath looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard, but my own vineyard have I not kept. Now, having said that, she says, they, they gnashed upon me with their teeth, and they sent false witnesses against me. So it may be, in fact, the false witnessing against her that may, in fact, have made the sons angry with her. We're not 100% sure on that. But that's one speculative, you know, angle of it. But my own vineyard have I not kept. So what she's saying is I've been forced to keep his vineyard. So that means the children of this world I have taught the spirit of his covenant to, which is the harlot. So in essence, she's playing the harlot. Now, why is black important here? Because we're told that Lucifer becomes the false light. That is shining down. That's important to the number 666. Because when you multiply 6 times 6 times 6. You get 216. Why is that important? Well, if you look the word. Let me see here. I got it pulled up. Strong's Hebrew. Where is it? Not right in that passage. 216 up. Guess what it is? The word is light. Female. A light. And what does it say? It says Lucifer can appear as an angel of light. The Shulamite says, look not upon me because I am black. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard. Now if we go to Revelations 14.4. 
we know that the first fruits that's being identified holding not defiled by women, that's the harlot Babylon, they're not defiled by her false lies, by her teachings. So, why is it important that we identify that? Because, okay, so I'm moving back and forth here between two and trying to find the passage I'm looking for. Did I pull it up? I'm not sure that I did. Okay, so I'll pull it up here. There it is. So in Revelations 14, 4, it says this. Okay, forgive me for, for being draggy here. Um, and this is concerning the first fruits, which we identified as daughters, women. It says, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. We're looking at the daughters of Zion. And the reason why they remain virgins is because when they are reborn out of the dust of the earth, Ariel, they're holding no guile of the harlot on their tongue. They're not exalting man as God. That's the false foundation. They are the real foundation of the world. Is what the world's law system, which was going to keep us washed and clean and, and with eternal life, that was the foundation that was supposed to be laid. But the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world was the righteous spirit, daughter Zion. Man rejected her in this covenant, which we identified in Malachi chapter 2. He dealt treacherously with the wife of his youth, yet is she the wife of your covenant. That's right. Her law will be established as the foundation of the world. That's what she was promised. So... That's why remain virgins is important. They're not holding the guile of the lie on their tongue. They follow the lamb wherever she goes. This is her personal inheritance. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and to the lamb. Now, why is this important to ascertain in our little brains that they're not male? Because if we don't have the first fruits, identified as the spirit of the new body, teaching the truth, then there is no redemption for mankind. Blood don't wash you. It's the water of the new spirit that washes you clean. Now if we go to the word defile, guess what it is? It's 3435. Three, and it means to stain, to defile. This idea defile is going to take us to Micah chapter 4. It says, let her eyes look upon Zion, let her be defiled. The Shulamite says, look not upon me, because the sun, the false light, has looked upon me and made me black. Here, these are women not defiled by the harlot Babylon's teaching. And this word here means, I soil, stain, pollute, defile. Properly to soil, make mucky, dirty, defile, besmirch. Um, smut. We know what that word means. Dirty minds. Dirty minds. Bring her down. Defile. Make her a harlot. Yeah, that's what that means. But what does this word take us to? 3189 is derived from this word. Guess what it means? Black. <laughs> you still think they're men? The Shulamite says, look not upon me because I am black. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyard. But my own I have not kept. So Solomon exalts himself in the house of the forest of Lebanon. If we go to Isaiah. Okay, wrong Isaiah. I'll get there. Okay, it's in the other passages. If we go to Isaiah, oh, I did it again, sorry, um, okay, it's this one, Isaiah 14, and keep reading, all right, we're going to find out a whole bunch of other stuff about Solomon. It says he smote the people, right? This is where we finished. All right? The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. 
Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee in the cedars of Lebanon. Okay? We're in Lebanon now. The house in the forest of Lebanon. Solomon discovered the covering of Judah. What protected him from death. He drained the well, the living water, which was supposed to come from the wife of the original covenant, is what we're told. I got a fly on my screen, sorry. And this is what we find here in Isaiah 14 to the one that eventually is seen exalting himself. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee in the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come against us. So, why is this particular passage important? Well, we identified the house in the forest of Lebanon, what we believed was the house in the forest of Lebanon that was actually being come against by men as if they were welding axes in a forest. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it sounds an awful lot like the house in the forest of Lebanon. And so if we go to Psalm 74, this is where we find them coming against, actually, I believe, a description of them destroying the house in the forest of Lebanon that the daughters exalted Mother God, and there they insert their own religious lie, is what they begin to do. So, a masculine of Asaph. So Asaph is your gatherer. It's another word for your spirit, or I believe, your coalith, which you find in Ecclesiastics chapter 12, I think. Do I got the right chapter? I said 9 in one of my videos. I believe it's 12. And the Koalith is your female assembler who assembles the Proverbs and still teaches knowledge to the children. That's what it says. So your Asaph is the gatherer, which is also likened to the horn of Ephraim. The horns of Ephraim will gather the people from the four corners of the world. That's the spirit reborn upon the earth. But she also has a right to fulfill the covenant wherein her covenant got unstrung. All right, her side of the covenant got unstrung. Now, I speculated, or I stated, that it was the righteous covenant restrung. I'm going to change that. I'm going to revise that a little bit because I'm looking at it a little differently because it didn't quite fit what we were reading. But, we'll read this. Oh God, why has thou cast us off forever? Why does thine anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember thy congregation. Now we see a congregation of women who publishes the word in Psalm 68. And we see the Lord that is burned to ashes, that's right, who's reborn out of the dust of the earth there, coming from Mount Sinai. Now that's interesting because that's where Moses went up, got these two tablets that had the original covenant it should have been and when he goes down he finds the children committing idolatry they've already made a golden calf male you changed your glory into an animal god says you didn't want the true glory you cast your covenant off to which what does moses do he slams them tablets down out of anger and then he goes up, and I believe what happens the next time around, because she is so angry, this Lord that comes from Mount Sinai that you see in Psalm 68, her number's 136 there, that's daughter's it's number, yep. And the wrath of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, they didn't want her covenant, that's right. And Moses goes up and gets the dispensation of the law from then on. Because they are casting her off in the spirit of her covenant. And that covenant was the original covenant that should have been established as the foundation of the world that our law system was founded upon. And was to be found at the wife of the original covenant, which he dealt treacherously with. Which then links us all back to what Solomon was doing and building up a harlot system. Now it also takes us to Zephaniah 5. So... I'll, I'll read this and then we'll go to Zephaniah 5. So i got to make a note here. So that number also, I'll say this. 
666 is 216 light. He was changing the light is what he was doing, what I was driving at. He was changing the light of Israel. And Israel is said to be where the light is found from. We identified that. You will not only be a light unto the Israelites, but you will be a light unto the Gentiles as well. That's a promise that her birthright will be made large. That's why she was slain before the foundation of the world. That's what we're told when we get understanding it all. But what Solomon was doing with this 666 number, which is the number of the covenant, he was actually changing it from light to dark. That's right. That's what he was doing. That's why the Shulamite says, Look not upon me because I am black. The false light began to shine on her and made her black. And in Job, it is akin to a yellow sun. The sun literally changed, is, is what you're, you're bearing witness to in Job 30 or 31. She says, My skin becomes black upon me and it begins to peel and burn. That's what she says. And that's because they began to cast off the light of her covenant, which was the real light of Israel. And that's why this number six times six times six uh, tallies to 216, which then in Strong's Hebrew is the light. It means light. He changed the light to darkness and established a harlot that would teach his religious lies. That's what we see. And... Uh, We'll look at Zephaniah because that attests to the covenant that they upheld. That's right. And we're still in it. It's the blind leading the blind. You're all moving into a sepulcher, which is Sheol, a pit, a grave. But she says, I have the keys now. I've got them. They belong to me. Um, so... Psalm 74 is where we find them actually coming against the house in the forest of Lebanon, which we just saw in Isaiah 14, right? Remember thy congregation, which has purchased of old the rod, the scepter of your inheritance, which thou has redeemed this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. They made her a dry desert land. That's what they did. Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolation, even all that the enemy has done wickedly in thy sanctuary. The sanctuary is the house in the forest of Lebanon. That's what it is. Isaiah 22. Um, thy enemies roar in the midst of thy congregation, and they set up their own signs. They set up their own signs is what they did. Their own religious lie. A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. What thick trees? What did she say? Isaiah 14, verse 8. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller, that's an axe cutter, has come against us. So back to Psalm 74. But now they break down the carved works thereof at once with axes and hammers. They were destroying what it represented. And this is akin to destroying woman's body. That's right. There's two temple in existence here. The man's body largely does represent the temple, while the woman represented the Holy One, the Spirit upon the earth, that he was to hearken to the Spirit of her covenant. Now, when he divided the pleasant land, he splits it which you see Solomon doing an allegory. That's right. And eventually she becomes the outcast that no man seeks a covenant with and completely wipes all knowledge of her covenant out of the land. That's what he does. So they have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled it by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. So they cast our dwelling place down, which is akin to a palace, our bodies, where we met with our mother. That's right. The spirit of the original covenant, which came from mother wisdom from above. And why we say it's a palace is because, once again, of the Shulamite in uh, Song of Songs chapter 8, where it says her breast becomes like towers once again. She was the stronghold of Israel. And where you were to receive your milk, your water, your washing from, 
That's right, your protection from her. She nourished you. She fed you what you need. Or she's going to once again. In Song of Songs, chapter 8, and it says, If you be a wall, we will build a palace upon you. And then we find that wall in Jeremiah chapter, I can't remember the chapter, it tells you clearly, it's daughter Zion, right? Who's the palace. So they tore her body down. That's right, they weakened her. It's a physical weakening that is seen going on here. Now they want to all say, oh, this is, this is, um, you know, truth in, um, you know, the physicality of the body. And yet, if you don't take in, um, the ritualistic uh, play-in and then the complete debasement of the woman under man and under his laws and what it led to in the defiling of the woman and how it literally is stated as weakening our bodies to make it more subject to him, um, then you don't get um, how the physicality could change if you don't understand the ritual behind what Solomon was really doing. And it was to, to defile her, to look upon her nakedness. And you get that understanding when he puts the false drink to her lip. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, you put strong drink to her lip, a lie. So you could look upon her nakedness, make her your harlot. Yet shameful spewing will come upon your foreskin. But we do see a weakening of her body addressed. In Job, it's 30 or 31, she says, My body now clings to me like mud. My body has become mud. This is not my garment. This is not my real garment. You took it from me. You stole it from me. That's what you did to me. When you made me black to teach your lying theology and you could play God. So... They have cast fire into the sanctuary and they have defiled you by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. They sit in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. God, Israel is called God wrestles. From this point on, we find the righteous spirit wrestling the enmity of the first woman we see there. I will cause enmity. Right? And this is the why Israel becomes called God wrestles. Israel was known as God upon this earth. The presence of God upon this earth. Here she is now found wrestling against the heartless spirit that man exalts in his heart. That's what we find uh, Israel wrestling against. Her adversary, the harlot that man exalts. Um, they have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. We see not our sign. There is no more any prophetess. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long this will last. So we see uh, two angels speaking. Um, they're on opposite banks. Uh, and there's a great water between them. And one angel asks the other, how long will this be? Right, and so we get this. None of us knows how long this will this will last. But then we see um, an answer in um, Daniel. Sorry, chapter twelve is where we see the two angels uh, speaking to one another. So God, how long will the enemy mock? And they do. They mock the divine feminine every day. Um, will the foe insult your name forever? And she says, I turned and hid my face from them to see what their latter end would be. Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? That's the daughter Zion identified. Had thou an arm like unto God, then I will confess unto thee. Know thee not thine own right hand can save thee? And if you go to Isaiah 51, Isaiah 52, and Psalm 89, it will identify the right hand for you as daughter Zion. That's right, women. Women, not men. When it says daughter Zion, it's not talking about men. Um, for God is my queen, not king, queen of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth through her daughters. That's right. Mother works salvation through her daughters. 
Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. This is the presence identified. If you go to Isaiah 63, you'll find her there dividing uh, the waters. <coughs> Red Sea is allegorical, of course, to your admixture of doctrine. Um, and when she parts the sea, it's akin to a birthing canal. Only she can do it. Um, thou breakest the heads of the dragon in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him to be meat to the people. Okay, so that's akin to the beast system. Thou did cleave the fountain and the, f and the flood. Thou driest up mighty rivers. The day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Okay, so here we see what we believe is the house in the forest of Lebanon actually being um, torn down by these men who had axes that was also cutting uh, down the trees of the forest of Lebanon. That's right. Um, so, have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of violence and cruelty. And that's what they began to perpetuate against their sisters, violence in the land, it says, you oppress me with your strong hand. That's where you also see him holding her up in oppression with his hand around her neck where she says, now my garment cleaves to me like dirt because she's been defiled. Yeah, she has no more strength under the law. He's made her his harlot is what he's done. And that's what Solomon was doing by taking so many wives. They weren't wives. Um... A man has one wife. That's the law of heaven established by great God Almighty. It was never one man and many wives. No, sorry. That's the lie of Baal. That's the lie of King Solomon. That's the lie of those uh, adulterous priests in the Old Testament who was doing things in the land that had never been seen before. Um, oh, let not the oppressed return a shame. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. And that's the Lord that awakens and is angered by the false image that she sees standing, which is akin to the idol of a man, your king, and God who washes you in blood. No, you don't get washed in blood. You get washed in water. That's what you get washed in. Arise, O God, plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Forget not the voice of thine enemies, the tumult of those that rise up against thee increases continually, and it did gain power. And they really began to gnash upon her to take the spirit of her covenant out of the land. And so, um, yea, the fir trees rejoice. Now we're back in Isaiah 14, right? No feller is come up against us. So, verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. So what, part of me wonders if as, as earth is moving upward, hell from beneath is moved when Satan is cast down from the heavens, if that's not uh, allegorical to that in some way. Hell from beneath. Now that's just me speaking. It's not necessarily true. Um, all they that speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Now, what we're going to speculate here is that may well be King Solomon. That's what I'm going to do here. Based on my understanding of Ezekiel 28 and all of these other passages that identifies what the key of David was and what King Solomon was attempting to put in play. And he was digging for another key is what he was doing. Which is then why the occult world begins to exalt the key of Solomon. That's, that's what they draw power from. That's right. That key of Solomon. And so it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? 
And what, and we're going to get there in a minute, what happens here is I began to question the death of Solomon. And the Bible does not tell you about the death of Solomon. That's interesting. You would think such a great king would be worth at least telling us how he died. Nowhere does it state how he died. It doesn't state he died. It says after the death of Solomon. But it, that's it. It gives absolutely no information about how he died. God did threaten this one that exalts himself, that God was going to send wicked men after, and death would come upon him in a wicked way. Now, if he exalted himself in the house of the forest of Lebanon, is it possible he also got exalted to the second heaven? as the king that sits on the throne of Babylon, which is the principality and the power of the air that governs this world right now. Which is why the occult world does call on the key of Solomon to give them power. It's speculation. Either he was took out in a very malicious, wicked way, which was what God promised him, Solomon, or this one that exalts himself. Or he's sitting on a throne in the second heaven and he's going to be akin to Satan falling. Because Satan we link to the name Adam. And when we look at the name Adam, I don't think in, in the situations that I'm talking about so much, as an individual, as it speaks to men, wicked men. The sons of Belial, the sons of Baal. These were wicked Adams who did not want the wife of his original covenant, the spirit of his original covenant was found at the wife of his youth, and he did not want her. And so it's a speculation, but it does line up with Solomon. So what does it say in 13? This is where it leads us to the house in the forest of Lebanon further. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Where? In the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So why was King Solomon... Digging, he drained the well first, the well of water. He dismantled it. These daughters that were witnessing to the truth of Mother God's laws from above to try to, 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 to be the covering to man, he tore them down. And he was digging. And he was digging for the key that was going to give him the throne of God. That's what he was after. That's what he was digging for. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be God. You see, King Solomon wanted to be God. And he begins to build the system that he thinks is going to give him the throne of God. That's the harlot foundation. That's what it is. Yea, thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit that you dug. That's right. You dug it. But what does the Lord say in Revelation? I actually managed to cut the S off on that one that time. What does the Lord say in Revelation? I am she, not he, that liveth and I was dead. See, they didn't think she had the power to be reborn upon the earth. That was their fatal flaw. That was Solomon. That was Baal's. That was Balak's. That was the wicked sons of Belial. These were all of their wrong thinking. They did not believe, I don't think, that she could be reborn upon this earth in the spirit of her covenant. They didn't believe that, I don't think. She says, I am she that liveth, and I was dead, 
that Lord that was burned to an ash heap in Psalm 68, surrounded by the congregation of women that published the word in the north. That's right, the congregation of the north that met in the house of the forest of Lebanon that then King Solomon tore down and repurposed for himself. That's right. I am she that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I now have the keys of hell and of death. That's right. What does it say of Israel? Where is it? Isaiah. Oh, I don't think I pulled this passage up. No, I didn't actually pull this one. This was one of the few I forgot to pull up. Okay. What does it say? Right here. It says this. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That's the Azazel goat with double upon her head, the she goat that you then find in the Abraham covenant. In Genesis 15, 9, as one of the animals promised full restoration back to her covenant, which then you see akin to the lilies of the covenant or the lily of the covenant. That's right. That's what they're known as. And it says Israel will flourish as the lily. That's right. She's going to flourish as the lily. And that's why a lily became very important to me. Well, many reasons. I had a dream of lilies in 2004 in a dry desert land that were being watered and it was my job to water them and there was a little bit more to the dream than that but anyway she has received double for all her sin what was placed upon the Azazel goat double for all of her sin they got his it was not a male it was a female and because she bears the double she ends up with the keys and that's why I questioned when the covenant that gets, that was unstrung by God so that he could oppress her, isn't the other half of that same covenant restrung. Because she says, if he does not turn from his wicked ways, I'm going to restring this covenant and I'm going to cut him away. So she uses the blood covenant in essence, to cut him away, and you find her, uh, did, did I say everything I wanted? Yeah, we'll finish right here again. The voice of her that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We find her doing that in Isaiah 42, in verse 8. I will destroy and I will devour at once. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I must restore back that which I took not away. I bore the sins as the glory that was cast down in Lamentations 2. When he took control of my host and, and exalted a harlot and became the king of Babylon. That's right. That's what we're looking at. And it was Solomon that was doing it and perpetuating it against his own women that he was supposed to be in covenant with, which he then daubs the gates over so they can no longer pass through the gates of David and we find them running over the wall that's right and the archers bail your husband shooting words fiery words at them to take the spirit of their covenant over the land yet her covenant her bow remains strong by the power of great God Almighty so that's right she, not he. And it links us to the wrath of the one that sits to the right hand of the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, whose number is 113. And that's Psalm 110. And she will strike through wrath, strike through kings in the day of her wrath. Sorry, I got that wrong. So, all right, now I just totally lost where I was going. Okay, so her wrath, right, 
is found in Isaiah 63. Again, they want to put a male here. No. Now, if we go to, and I did want to hit on Zephaniah 3 again too. I ain't got there again yet. Um, so we're going to go right there. So if we go to Zephaniah 3, 1, I found this interesting. It says, Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. So it's identifying what the men of Israel, and we, we've looked at this, so I'm not going to go over it all again, had the serpents in the wilderness, was those women that Balaam told Balak to go get the women from the surrounding Adamic nations and send them into the men of Israel and seduce them. And they begin, over time, we see this, making covenant with these harlot daughters that they were instructed by God not to marry. Solomon was instructed the same thing. He still did it. So, woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. So what becomes exalted in modern day Israel is actually the harlot spirit, which they call the laws of God, the Torah. Well, the Torah is what was used to put the false foundation that would exalt man as God. The Ten Commandments, Christ is seen as the second Adam he's supposed to be, walking her laws. That's what he did, and that's why he was crucified. That's why. But she ends up with two covenants, holding two covenants, and the right to both of them is what it kind of looks like. Now, I'm going with that thought because of what we're going to read in Isaiah 63. First, we're going to re finish reading this. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord, and she drew not near to her God. All right. These were the women that were turning away, and we see the Shulamite. It says, return, return, O Shulamite. What might we see when the Shulamite returns, as it were, the company of two armies? Now, they were hearkening to the spirit of this covenant that man had established. So they become defiled. They won't receive the correction of the Holy One of Israel, who we see standing in Zephaniah, I believe it's chapter 10, Zechariah chapter 10 which I didn't pull up. We've looked at this. And this is important to establish as a female, which we did. Zephaniah 10, 7. What is it? What does it say? No, Zechariah, sorry. Oh, it's not 10. It's 11, sorry. I do this every time. So let's go to 11. It's hard to keep all of these in your your mind. <clears throat> so eleven seven, I think, is um, the one I'm looking for. It is Zachariah. Yeah, I'm sure it's Zachariah. Okay, sorry, it's not giving me the the proper parallel here. Come on. Okay, so now we'll go to chapter 11. Sorry, I'm so slow. And I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, and we, I'll try to think of everything um, that I didn't say that needs to be said. So Zechariah 11, verse 7, it says this, and it tells us that she did indeed break her covenant with them, which means her spirit of the covenant comes off the daughters. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called band, and I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their souls also abhorred me. Then said I, I will not feed you, you that dieth, let it die, that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. So, she takes her staff, beauty, and she cuts it asunder. It's a symbol of her covenant being broke. And it's called beauty because it was a, pe a law of peace. It was a rule of peace. And it says, you refuse the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. The scepter between Judah's feet will not depart until she 
to whom it belonged before the foundations of the world when the lamb was slain belongs to her. That scepter belongs to her. It is the spirit of her covenant that was to rule the kingdom. That's why um, it's a beautiful covenant because it is a covenant of peace and no violence and a, a, of love and equality. All right, man wasn't over woman, which is what this lying theology of Baal, your husband, established by men like King Solomon, began to teach upon this earth. And it was founded upon a false foundation. So, she says, I take my staff, even beauty, and I cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock waited upon me, and they knew that it was the word of the Lord. So they knew precisely what she was doing. And then she breaks her inheritance, Heblin, the other staff. It meant she was breaking her covenant with her personal inheritance, these daughters who taught the word of mother from above. To which we then just saw in Zephaniah 3, she obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, and she drew not near to her God. Because the spirit of the covenant had come off these daughters, these women. And then they began to turn to their husbands, believing that they were Lord and Master over all, and that God's a he, he, he. That's the harlot spirit. And when we go in, and we look up the words here, Woe to the city of oppressors, okay? Pollute it. 1351 means to defile, all right? So the men took charge of the word of the law. They drained her waters. Zion becomes a dry desert land. And what does it say? I have polluted and I have stained all of my raiment. Who is that that stained all of their raiment? It appears to be man. Because he began to write blood into her law. And then he took control of it is what he did. So I have polluted and stained all my raiment. Because he defiled her. That's what he did. And then you come down lower and it says defiled himself. And he did. By defiling the spirit of the original covenant, he actually defiled himself is what he did. So through the idea of um, freeing to soil or figuratively desecrate, defile, pollute, and stain. Now, we go to, if I can find it. Okay, so this is in the other line. We will go to Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, she says, I'm going to destroy the flock in your midst. That's right. And she uses the covenant <clears throat> that was created by Adam himself by fulfilling it. That's what it looks like. That's why it says in Psalm 7, if he does not turn from his wicked ways, I will restring my covenant. And that's the covenant of death that she's restringing there. Because she had unstrung it. God did unstring that covenant with the daughters and weakened her. That's what it states. And But it looks like then it gets restrung. Because it says if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. So we see the reason why it was permitted. What shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That's 144,000 principles. It says wisdom is the principle. That's your first fruits. She's the chief of the kingdom. You are to hearken to the spirit of her covenant, not a harlot that builds a man up. So it says, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? So she's destroying the harlot spirit in the midst. And in the process, she's making her outer garment, her glory, red. That's the fulfilling of Adam 1's covenant. All right? And the cutting away. Right? Of the harlot spirit and those men of Baal and Belial that exalts her. This that is glorious in her apparel, not him. She is 
the Lord that sits too. The high priest after the order of Melchizedek, that's Joshua the second Adam, in Psalm 110, he sits to the right of mother, and to his right is the daughter of Zion, 136 is her number, she's also the Lord, or the turtle dove, that was burned to ashes, um, an ash heap, the Ariel, Psalm 68, and I just lost Isaiah 68. I gotta try and pull it up again. And she is the one striking through kings in the day of her wrath. 63. Isaiah 63. If not, I'll go to my Bible. If it won't, let me pull it up. So that's why it's it's her wrath here playing out. Because it is her wrath, it states. She is the one that will strike through kings in the day of her wrath. The wrath of the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And it was the spirit of her covenant that man rejected. So, this that is glorious in her apparel, traveling in the greatness of her strength. That's with her 144,000 is what it looks like. I that speak in righteousness am mighty to save. Um... Actually, maybe not, because she states she's alone, too. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? So, they, they shed blood. They shed great blood against these daughters. And she died in the process, as we see her being burned to ashes, as that heap of ashes in Psalm 68, which is also identified as Ariel, who speaks out of the dust of the earth. That's the lioness of God, who will strike through Kings in the day of her wrath, you find them as lionesses lying with the dew, the doctrine of truth in their mouth. In the book of Micah, chapter, it's four or five. So, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like her that treadeth in the wine fat? It's told us, Micah 4, verse 13, she will thresh the nations. It's her. Uh, verse 3, I have trodden the wine press alone. <clears throat> and of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and I will trample them in my fury. This is the wrath of her that sits through to the high priest. After the order of Melchizedek in Psalm 10, his number's 113 there. There's three lords sitting. And it looks like the, the structure of that actually changes around in the heavens. So here... Uh, when the wrath begins to fall, the structure is mother and then son and daughter as the right hand. When we come to the heavenlies and they take, she takes her throne, it changes. Mother is sitting in the middle. Then it looks like the high priest after the order of Melchizedek sits to the left. And daughter Zion is identified as the right hand of God. That's what it looks like. And the deed belongs to her, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, and the wrath that she has acquired by bearing the sin upon her head twofold. She actually acquires the right, and she also acquires the key to hell and um, the grave, the pit. That's what she says in um, Revelations 1.18. I am the one that was dead and am alive. It's Ariel. Um, in Isaiah 29, that was burned to ashes. And so she says, For I will tread them in my anger, and I will trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all of my raiment. She stains it red. She is the commander of the host that man cast down. In the book of Daniel, uh, that you find a, a, a harlot being exalted in man's heart, basically so he can claim the throne for himself, is what he's doing. We link it to Solomon. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So that's the day of the Lord. You find it in Revelation 1.18. She says it. I am she that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell, death, and the grave. And in Revelations 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll. That's the deed of earth. You find her also as the angel taking back what belonged to her. In uh, Revelation 10, that mighty angel, that's her with her deed. 
That's right. It belongs to her. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open it. This belongs to you, my Lord, because you were slain. You were the lamb that were slain before the foundation of the world that man rejected a covenant with. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. So by her death, we are told in Revelations 11 that if the, the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. So we see why she was slain. So that all nations would be hers, would be claimed by her. And they are not claimed so much by the blood as part of it. There's a twofold covenant going on here. That's why she's allowed to put it in play and to cut away all those who shed blood and violence and built themselves up with thick clay under the law so they could be rich men. That was Solomon. He was really in love with himself and his power. And you purchased to God persons from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. And she did. Revelation 13.8 all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast and whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So that was the spirit of the original covenant identified as a virgin-like animal is, is what they give there of a lamb. But it's virgin-like quality. It's identifying the daughter of Zion whom the first Adam did not want to receive the law at her mouth in the spirit of her covenant. So we see him gnashing at her to take the spirit of her covenant out of the land to bring her under him. So then in the creation account, we see woman under man playing his harlot. That's what we really see. When she was really the glory on top. And that mankind was to hearken to the spirit of her covenant and he dealt treacherously with her. Now, if we go to, and I'm going to have to wrap it up here. If we go to... Okay, so it's here somewhere. Ezekiel 28. This is what we're going to discover. If we understand who the wisest man in God's word is stated as being, and we all know the answer to this one, don't we? Oh, wasn't it King Solomon? <clears throat> it was, wasn't it? It was King Solomon. All right. What does it say in Ezekiel 28? The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Where's that? Lebanon. Oh, look at that. That's Lebanon. Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God. Guess what Lord we're looking at here speaking. To this king is trying to exalt himself over the true Lord of the kingdom. Lord 136 is her number here. That's daughter Zion's number who's promised to strike through kings in the day of her wrath. And the king that she's really after, who has the number of a man, 666, who changed her light from light to darkness to defile womankind under man, the king she's really after is King Solomon. That's who she's after. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is filled up, lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. In the midst of the sea, that's allegorical to the beast system that he made, Leviathan, that's right, who comes against the behemoth. Uh, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. Oh, yeah, he did. He played God. In the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man. You're not God. See, he can't make himself live again. He can't. Once he's dead, he's dead. She says, I swear by myself that I live forever. And she says that in Deuteronomy 32. And you know it's her because she says, you forgot the rock that birthed you and writhed in pain to bring you forth. And who's, who, where does the water pour from? The rock. You forgot the God that gave life to you. The divine feminine 
You forgot about her, but don't worry, I have the power to live again, and I swear by myself that I will be reestablished upon this earth. And what does it say? Isaiah 29. I hear a familiar spirit as of one who speaketh out of the dust of the earth. She is reborn. She is past, present, and future. But in the midst of the sea, yet you are just a man and not God. Name for Israel? God wrestles. That's the meaning of Israel. And it is derived from the word Sarah. Oh my gosh. Uh, but it's not really that that name, Sarah. That's what they'll tell you. Bull crap. That's Eliza Bell. Yet thou art a man and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So he sets himself in the midst of the sea. Sea is also allegorical to peoples and nations. And so he made himself a god in the land. That's akin to the statue of gold standing that everybody had to bow down to. That's right, and worship. To which you find the Lord 136 number awakening and is angered by the image that you see. The image there is male. That's right. What does verse, excuse me, 3 says, watch this. This is going to zero us in on the man. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Whoop. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. He dug down into the pit. He drained the well of water. He dismantled the stones of the well. Right? And he continued to dig down. He was trying to raise an army of the dead. Is almost what it looks like. Whether that's... I'm just, I'm just throwing off thoughts here right now. But that's what he was doing. To try to exalt himself as king and God. He was trying to take God's throne away from her. And so he dismantles the well. Zion becomes a dry desert land, right? And yet we see the Azazel goat bearing double upon her head. It's a she-goat bearing double for what Israel did. And then we see her battle is over, right? And then we see her in Isaiah 63, her wrath being perpetuated. As um, the daughter of Zion that you see in Micah 4.13, threshing the nations. That's right. And she is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. It was not a man. It was not. Um, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. Who was wiser than Daniel? Who was the wisest man in the Bible? King Solomon. And we're told he went after the covering of Judah, which was the daughters of Zion. We're told that he daubed up the gates in David, his father's wall. We're told he took 700 harlot wives from the surrounding nations. He brought King Pharaoh's daughter up in 1 Kings 9.24, <coughs> to which he built a palace for her to stay in. So we're looking at the house in the forest of Lebanon, which takes us to Isaiah 22. So who was wiser than Daniel? King Solomon. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom, hmm, and with thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. And that is what King Solomon was after. He wanted to build himself up as a great king and God upon this earth. Now I'm going to probably end there because my video is getting long. But I do think, <clears throat> for the most part, we have established what the house in the forest of Lebanon was, why it was relevant, why it was important, that the number 666 does link back to the beast system that Solomon was attempting to establish. And he was attempting to establish it to overthrow the throne of God, which was the daughters of Israel and their law.
They came from God from above. That's right. This is what we are being shown when we understand beyond a shadow of a doubt what the key of David is. By understanding what the key of David is, we then are able to uh, retrieve the keys of, um, what was it, hell and death, which is what she says, the lamb says, that was slain before the foundations of the world, and I have the keys of hell and death now. And Psalm 7 says this. Where is it? Okay, I have light there. All right, I'll pull it up. Psalm 7. I wanted to read more than this, but you know, the video is really long now. I apologize for that. So Psalm 7, <clears throat> what does it say? And man hasn't repented of their sins. They haven't. They, they reproach us daily. And I think Satan, who is the accuser, he accuses us daily in heavens. It's Solomon that's doing it. And, um, where is it? Arise, O Lord, in thine anger. And she is an angry Lord. We saw her in Isaiah 63. And she is the Lord that sits to the right hand in Psalm 110, who strikes through kings in the day of her wrath. She is the Lamb, the wrath of the Lamb. Um, lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Awaken, O Lord. So shall the congregation of the people compass thee about for their sakes, therefore return thou on high. So we see her actually being enthroned. Shake the dust from off thee, O captive daughter of Zion, and take your throne. All right, we find her that in Isaiah 52, which was helped to identify the right hand that will strike through kings in the day of her wrath. That's right. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. My defense is of God. I hold her law of truth in my mouth. And it says truth is the banner that's actually going to be heard in the heavens. And that may be what we take a look at to link us all back. <clears throat> and, and how that's the banner that gets waved when you get in trouble. Or, um, I'm not saying it right. You will begin to wave a flag to come and rescue, to come and retrieve us. Get us out of here. So God says, when um, I see the truth in the earth, it will rise up to the heavens because the truth cannot not be heard in the heavens. When it begins to be uttered on earth, it is a sign. The flag, the banner of truth is waving and the escape is imminent. All right, that's what's stated in the passages that we will read next um, and hopefully finish up. All in the house in the forest of Lebanon. So what does it say here? We'll finish up with this. If he turn not, she, not he, will wet her sword. She had bent her bow and she has made it ready. Right? She had also prepared for him the instruments of death. She holds the keys now. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. The spirit of the original covenant. Because Adam, or Judah, chose to marry the daughter of a harlot. Or a harlot daughter spirit. That's what he chose of a strange god. The strange god <laughs> was Adam exalting himself. Which is akin to Solomon exalting himself as God. And to tear her down, to gnash at her, to try to take the spirit of her covenant out of the land. She became the outcast that no man sought a covenant with. 
She is identified as the presence of God. She is the camp of Mahanaim that the Shulamite is seen shepherding a double camp. Return, return, O Shulamite. What might we see when the Shulamite returns? As it were, the company of two armies. That's the 144,000 daughters of Zion. And if you read in Song of Songs, you find them identified as she-goats. She's shepherding a flock of she-goats. And they're also identified as the lilies of the covenant, which you find in the books of Psalms that David speaks of, which is also where we're going to find our passages that we're going to take a look at next. So, if he turn not, she will wet her sword. She hath bent her bone. She has made it ready. That's right. We find the daughters being shot at as they pa pass over the wall in Joseph's blessings. And these are your scions, your daughters, your female scions, Zion. That's who they were shooting at. Um, she had also prepared for her, him, the instruments of death. She ordaineth her arrows against the persecutors. Behold, she travaileth, or he travaileth, with iniquity. And they have conceived mischief, indeed, and brought forth falsehood. So we will just finish this. He has made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch himself, which he made. And they do. Man will go, he, he, he. They can't say the pronoun he enough. It's amazing. He, he, he. And yet God says, let's make them in our image. And it's a male and it's a female. And it's a female that's the life giver. And yet... It's a he, he, he. Ho, 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 ho. Somebody got something screwed up. Major league there. But they did it on purpose because they want it to be God. That's right. And yoke woman. They'll talk about feminism being the destroyer of the world. What was the destroyer of the world? Was man playing God thinking he had a God-given right to yoke woman under him in the first place? You created the mess. She created the mess by playing your harlot. You're right. We're both guilty. Eh? Until she picks her head up and is holding no guile of that ridiculous covenant on her tongue. So his mischief shall return upon his own head. And his violent dealing shall come down upon his own head. I will praise the Lord according to her righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. So, he dug the pit. That's what he did. And I'm going to leave it there. It's getting late. Um, I'll look over what I didn't share. Try to keep track of it. And we'll take a look at the glory that sits between the cherubim that we're going to find in the next passages that we're going to take a look at to do with the covenant of the lilies. All right. And it's identified who it is. And um, so if I failed here to share anything, um, I will take a note down. And um, yeah, there is actually another thing. This will be this will be the final. And I figure it because I had so much information. And we also have we have two or three things that we're gonna look at to finish up. And um, so that will be my video. And um, so I thank you all for watching my videos. Sorry I've been a while on this one. I actually did try to record and there was no sound. It was an hour and a half. And I was really exhausted that night. And, uh, and for some reason it just it didn't kick in. My, my sound didn't kick in and pick up. It was the headphones triggered of course by a wireless device here. And um, anyway... Um, so I'm sorry it took a while to get it up. I thank all for watching my videos. Um, I pray the Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth. And um, I hope you all have a really nice evening. That's what it is here. And um, thanks again for watching.